I'm Grace Trimper. And I'm Jessica Hollister. And we're members of the Winnie Lurk Preservation Committee. Today, we're interviewing digital archivist Sarah Cogley and archivist for Special Collections Maria Leah. They are both serving as interim co-university archivists at the University at Buffalo. Sarah and Marie, thank you very much for joining us today. We're wondering why you decided to choose this particular correspondence to read from. So we actually chose a series of letters instead of just one letter uh, because we thought that it demonstrates the evolution of the relationship between uh, Darwin D. Martin, who was the client, and Frank Lloyd Wright, who was the architect on this project. And the correspondence kind of spans the construction of the Martin family's two homes, the Martin House in the Parkside neighborhood in Buffalo and Greycliff um, in Derby, New York. And actually, I think it, it goes beyond that. It, it goes um, closer to the end of Darwin Martin's life. But we think that the, the letters kind of demonstrate that their relationship wasn't just a business relationship, although it did start out that way. Um, they ended up having a kind of a personal relationship, a friendship. We also think that the collection that these papers came from resonates locally uh, in the Western New York community. Um, the Martin family was very prominent through their association with the Larkin Company, where Darwin D. Martin was um, a top execu executive. And, you know, the Martin House and Great Cliff are known both outside of Western New York. They're known nationally and internationally, especially among the architecture community, you know, all the admirers of Frank Lloyd Wright's designs. So we thought that it had the correspondence had kind of broad reach to a lot of different audiences. December 10th, 1902, Darwin D. Martin to his brother, William E. Martin. Dear brother, the lot Mr. Wright likes is the northwest corner of Jewett and Summit Abs, diagonally opposite the church. I have tried all summer to buy it for $12,000. Owners want $17,000. I have finally told the owner's representative that if he would submit me an option on the place $14,000, I would consider it. Bell and I, with Dorothy, plan to go to Chicago the first week in January. I will write Frank today asking if we can put up with him, believing it will be much more convenient all around and will, we hope, help to establish more cordial relations. Sincerely yours, D.D. Martin. Buffalo, New York, March 20th, 1903. Darwin D. Martin to Mr. John D. Larkin of the Larkin Company. Mr. Larkin, at the risk of appearing to have been made intoxicated by my contact with Frank Lloyd Wright, I do not hesitate to say that at the outset of this, my report of my interview with him, which lasted all day, that I believe we have greatly underestimated our man. This is because of his youth, the newness of our acquaintanceship and its limitations, and also because of the adverse things we have heard about Wright, which are due to his radical departure from conventional lines. March 26, 1903, Darwin D. Martin to Frank Lloyd Wright. Dear sir, the more Mrs. Martin turns the matter over in her mind, the more unhappy she becomes about your exteriors. I think the awful frick approach and entrance is what most distresses her, and possibly, hurtly, has something to do with it. I think she fully agrees with me that the interior of our home will be safe in your hands, and that only the exterior causes anxiety. March 27, 1903. Frank Lloyd Wright to Darwin D. Martin. Mr. D. D. Martin, I am extremely sorry Mrs. Martin is still unhappy over our exteriors. If she has not seen enough to assure her of a certain capacity and versatility in creating beautiful homes, I can say nothing to comfort her unless she might be pointed to the fact that each client is finally satisfied and our enthusiastic advocate. But if Mrs. Martin could not feel in the atmosphere for the work something as true and simple as it is broad and capable, she would be a very foolish woman to entrust me with the designing of her home. She would be wasting the opportunity of her life, for no opportunity seems to me quite so much the opportunity of one's life as the building of the home. Yours truly, Frank Lloyd Wright. August 23rd, 1904. Darwin D. Martin to Frank Lloyd Wright. Dear sir, the Barton basement is still afloat. We conclude it is largely due to your plan for lawns to be flat. We shall remove the top foot of cinders round the wall, replace with a foot of hard tamped clay, raise lawn two inches above base of water table and decline to grade 10 feet from house, i.e. fall of one inch in five feet. August 25th, 1904, Frank Lloyd Wright to Darwin Martin. Dear sir, you might as well put a cinder in your eye, 
gum shoes on your feet and throw $50 out of the window as to go into the scheme you propose for the relief of the Barton basement. May 16, 1906. Frank Lloyd Wright to Darwin Martin. My dear DDM, my proposition was to settle on the basis of $100,000 total expenditure, including furniture and gardener's cottage and any little things that you may want in future pertaining to them directly. This figures in behalf of the indigent architect, the author of all your trouble and a wee bit of your glory, a balance due of $1,346.32. I said I would take $1,200 and stand pat for future trifles, and I will do so now. On my last visit, I said I was awfully in the hole, and I was, and that if you would pay me at that moment $500 and give me $500 more as soon as you could, I would accept it. But that was crowding the assistant chief mourner, that's me, too hard. I need money awfully, but don't think that a sufficient or becoming reason for asking me to take less than my sane proposition of $1,200. Yours as ever, right. October 12, 1910. Frank Lloyd Wright to Darwin Martin. My dear D.D. Martin, you probably know by this time that I have returned to my work and home. I have no apology to make, an explanation perhaps. I think you too realize that after we as human beings have developed mentally and spiritually to a certain extent, we carry within us our own heaven and our own hell. I feel strongly that my work must not die. No one can do it so well as I. I love it enough to make a determined fight for it. It will be a long struggle, I fear. I am uncertain what course to pursue. If you have any friendly interest in me left, I wish you would take time to write me your views. Believe me as always, sincerely your friend, Frank Lloyd Wright. October 14th, 1910, Darwin Martin to Frank Lloyd Wright. Dear Mr. Wright, I found your very welcome letter of the 12th at home last night. Unless this letter appears to begin with a scold, let me assure you at the outset that I am no knocker, have no grievance, and am rejoicing with all your friends for the return of the prodigal, for that's what you are, whether or not you know it. Let me relieve you at once of any idea that I have suffered on my own account, or as you put it, eaten humble pie because of you. All of your past clients and others interested must anticipate that, as you say, you are better qualified by European travel and study to do stronger work than before. I do not think anyone will be any more scared to employ you in the future than in the past. With kindest regards from my family to your family, I am sincerely yours. December 6th, 1935, Frank Lloyd Wright to Isabel Martin. My dear Mrs. Martin, I'm terrified by what you say of dear DDM. I feel as though a strong, sane comradeship has ended for me and as though all might end likewise. In the retrospect, I am sure only human values have any value. And on that intrinsic basis, Darwin D. Martin and his wife and Frank Lloyd Wright and his old Ivana have a blessed relationship to treasure and trade on. I only wish I had been less taking and more giving where he was concerned, but character is fate, and mine got me into heavy going, and no safe harbor yet in sight. Feel my sympathy, my love for you both. Affectionately, Frank Lloyd Wright, Tallison, Spring Green, Wisconsin. You kind of touched upon this just now, but what makes these letters so compelling to you? The correspondence demonstrates just how much artistic control uh, the architect had over the design, so that, you know, how much control over the space that Wright had, um, to the point that the Martins were sometimes unhappy, which I think ultimately led to Isabel Martin's uh, heavier involvement in the design of Greycliff. Um, she really wasn't happy with um, a lot of the design um, in the Darwin Martin house, but Greycliff really more um, was created to ship her. Um, and so it's typical for clients to provide from my understanding, specifications to their architects, um, or at least be more heavily involved in the aspect of that process. Um, but these letters paint a picture, you know, it's a, it's a back and forth between the client and the architect, but ultimately, you know, Wright had a clear vision and Martin trusted Wright um, enough to pretty much just hand over the reins and let the construction of his own home be a passion project for Wright. Um, and at the same time, throughout this process, which you know, did go on for a long time, he propped up Wright's future business. And I think we were thinking about um, this idea of art versus home. You know, Wright is known for designing um, in 
sympathy with the environment, at least the um, like natural environment, so the built environment with the natural environment. But it's like he didn't really. Sometimes when you're in those houses, like it can feel like the house doesn't take into account people in the environment. So, um, like I, we wonder sort of how he imagined people existing in this space. Um, whereas, I, like I personally feel like when I'm at Great Cliff, um, like I can I can feel why I can feel the design elements that sort of lend themselves to people experiencing both the house and nature. Um, so, I guess we should have felt like that. Right, designed the home to fit into the natural world, almost to the exclusion of people. Um, so we thought that that, seeing the back and forth and the development of the plans, like that was an interesting aspect of it. Thank you for that. And if a modern or younger generation were to read these series of correspondence, what do you think their response would be? What do you think they would get out of it? Well, the the first thing I think that Marie and I recognized was that, you know, so these letters were written in the early 1900s, so over 100 years ago. And locally, so much has changed in Buffalo in that period of time. You know, we now kind of have this like Rust Belt heritage and there was major kind of deindustrialization that happened. But when Wright was building this home, designing the home, you know, Buffalo was booming at that time. There were millionaires, you know, self-made millionaires living here and industrialists living here. So if I was reading these letters for the first time and I wasn't familiar with the history of Buffalo, it might seem almost unbelievable that there were people in the community that had enough wealth to commission their own home, you know, from from an architect of right stature, although he was, you know, still kind of, I think, at the beginning of his career at this point. But, you know, and they didn't ask him to design one home. They asked him to design two homes, <laughs> you know. And actually, the right house is part of a larger complex. So it's not, you know, there's, these are almost kind of compounds. So it's, as an outsider looking in, you know, if I was a, if I was of a younger generation, I would be like, it's, it's unbelievable that there was this much wealth in Buffalo. So I think that's kind of interesting to reflect on. And I think it's also worth thinking about how in asking Wright to design these homes, I suspect that Martin was kind of intrigued by having this young, you know, different architect, you know, employed by him, but really kind of investing in architecture in a space is really a way to kind of contribute to the long-term cultural significance of a place. So these homes, these buildings, um, and the landscapes around them have really become cultural heritage landmarks um, that Buffalo and Western New York kind of hang their hats on, I think. And uh, I don't know that Martin, I don't know if he had the foresight to to realize like that what was happening was special. I think Wright probably did, (laughs) did. Um, just from what I can tell about his personality, I'm sure he was, you know, really excited about these projects and, and thought, you know, you know, I'm going to be a big deal. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Martin had that intention or not, but uh, regardless of that, that's what has happened um, with these two properties. So that's kind of exciting to think about as well. Yeah, as a as a young person in Buffalo, I agree that it is really exciting, and it's it's fun to think about how different our city was a hundred years ago completely different from how it is now. Yeah, and not only is it is it different now, but that the design of that house in that period was like radically different, right? I mean, there are, I think that there are newspaper clippings that we have where, you know, whatever the precursor was to the Buffalo News, people were like, can you believe this house? Like, what are they thinking? And if you look at the homes around it, they're very traditional, you know, Victorian homes, which, you know, are very common in the Parkside neighborhood. And then you come around the corner and you see this prairie style house that just doesn't fit at all. And even to this day, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit even with the newer homes that have been built or renovated in the Parkside neighborhood. So, uh, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. (laughs) Um, We have one more question for you. If you could speak to Darwin Martin and Frank Lloyd Wright, what would you want to ask them? Uh, we, I think, ultimately would really want to know, um, like, from Martin, if he was ultimately satisfied with how the house turned out, you know, whether it was the design he wanted or if it's 
successful just in being a product of wanting a new and exciting architect to build his house. And I think similarly, we would ask Wright if he was happy with the outcome as well, um, having to give in a little bit, but still pretty much ultimately having control over the design. And we, we would also want to find out how he felt about Greycliff, which again is very different from the city house and built more toward, you know, the client's specific. You know, because you can see this sort of like contentious, you know, friendly and contentious relationship, I guess I would say. I sort of get the sense through the letters that they're still sort of enjoying interacting with each other, even when they're disagreeing. I, I think it would just be interesting to hear more about each side, how they felt later. Um, about their yeah, I would just add that um, your point about how the letters were sometimes contentious, but you got the feeling, you get the feeling that they kind of like enjoyed the volley. Um, and when we've shared these letters with researchers who come to the archives to look at them, I mean, nine times out of 10, people start smiling when they read them just because, you know, it's the way that Wright can kind of insult his clients in these letters and yet still retain their business is pretty is pretty amazing. And he, I think that he was a very charismatic person. And you, you can tell that in the correspondence. And Wright and Martin, I would say, seems like a very loyal person. And I think he felt loyalty to Wright. So you can kind of see that through the correspondence, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, because for all we talk about how, you know, Wright in some ways imposed or, you know, really wants to take ownership of the design, you mean you don't get the feeling that Martin was like was taken advantage of in that sense. I mean, he really engaged with Wright because he admired his work and he wanted him to build the house and obviously believed in him as an artist and his vision enough to be to support him financially. So that's I think what gives the you know the tenor of those letters more of a sort of friendly sparring, even as you're kind of amazed at the back and forth. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of rare that you get that kind of compatible personality match in a you know, client contractor relationship like that. Yeah, absolutely. And also, even though you can see that they, with the back and forth, it feels friendly, but it's also very formal in the way it's written, which I think is a product of its time. And so to, to your earlier question about modern or younger generations reading these letters, I mean, they're just written in a different way than, than we correspond today, I think in their formality. But that also makes it kind of, makes them enjoyable, I think, to read. It's like when you discover an insult in like an Austin book or something because you, it's wrapped up in such formality that you really have to think about it. You have to read it twice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and understand, yeah, the, the etiquette of the day. Thank you, Sarah and Marie, for joining us on Winnie Lark's podcast from the past. My name is Jessica Hollister. My name is Grace Trimper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.